Well, good evening. Glad you guys are all here worshiping with us, whether you're here in person or you're watching online. We're glad that you are joining us for our family worship service tonight. Uh, we are going to be looking tonight in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Our original plan was to do a chapter a week for four weeks, uh, but because we have decided to extend our family worship services through the month of August, uh, I decided to take a little extra time in chapter 4. So today we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8, and then we'll come back next week and hopefully finish chapter 4 off. Uh, but we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8. There's so much here in, in just these few verses. Uh, we could spend a lot more time than that on it. Uh, but we're going to try to get through those eight verses tonight. And if you remember leading up to this, in the first three chapters, there's a lot of stuff going on. But just to give you a little bit of a recap, Timothy is a, a faithful servant raised in a, a faithful home with a mother and grandmother who instilled in him the truth of God's word. In uh, chapter 2, we see that uh, Paul is telling him, be a, a good soldier, be a, a hardworking farmer, work hard for what God has called you to do. And then last, uh, well, I guess it wasn't last week, two weeks ago in chapter 3, we talked about the fact that he would need to do this because false teachers are coming in. They're going to come in and they're going to disrupt what is going on and you need to be faithful to endure through that. He says in, in verse 12 of chapter 3 that all, all of us, as faithful followers of Christ are going to experience persecution in some form or fashion. And so he wants him to endure in that. And chapter 4 is an extension of that. We see more in chapter 4 about what he is called to do. At the end of chapter 3, he talked about what God's word was useful for, that it is God-breathed, it is perfect, it is the truth, and it is useful, it is effective. And so now, going into chapter 4, he continues on in that thought process as he is speaking to Timothy, a teacher, a pastor, a shepherd in the church. So look at chapter 4. We're going to start by reading just verses 1 and 2. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. So he starts this off with saying, I charge you. I charge you. This is how he starts off this final chapter, with a charge or a command, really. This is a, this is a command. Do this. And this charge is in light of all that he said in chapter 3. There's false teachers that are going to come in. They're going to corrupt and they're going to divide. Persecution is to be expected and in light of the fact that Scripture is from God. It is perfect, it is right, it is useful for getting people back on the right track. Remember we talked last week about how it wasn't just, Scripture isn't just useful for showing people they're wrong, it's useful for helping people get back on the right track. So in light of all that, Paul issues this command to Timothy. His command is simple, teach the word. That word charge there can be and sometimes is translated as command. And it, it is a forceful directive or order, as if coming from a, a commanding officer in the military. It's not really a suggestion. It is a command. Do this. And his charge, he says, is later in verse 1, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom. So... But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to charge you to do this, and by the way, God's here, and Jesus is here, and he, by the way, he's the one that's going to judge. So don't, don't do this because I said so, do this because he's here. He's saying that God himself is a witness to this charge he's giving him. It's kind of the picture you get here is they're in a courtroom, and Jesus is there on the stand as the judge, and Paul is giving this command to him, with Jesus himself, the judge, as the witness of it. This is important stuff. He is the judge. And the reality here is that Jesus himself will judge the actions of the teachers of his word. Now, he will judge everyone. 
But specifically here, he's talking about the, he will judge or evaluate those who teach his word. He will judge them according to what they've done. So when Paul charges Timothy here in this letter, he does so in the presence of the one who is going to evaluate or judge his work as a minister of the gospel. So by the way, if you're a leader in the church, if you're one who teaches the word, whether it's up here, whether it's in a classroom with little kids or some, somewhere else, Understand this, you are accountable to the judge for how you handle his word. And by the way, it's important to understand this judgment is not judgment by Jesus on someone's worthiness to enter the kingdom. That's not what he's talking about here. <clears throat> Romans 8, 1 and 4 says, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. So he says there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. So when he says this to Timothy, he's saying in the, in the listening of Jesus, the judge, he's not saying he's going to judge you and decide whether you get to go to heaven based on how you handle his word, because there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. Instead, this judgment is more like an evaluation of how we've handled the ministry God has assigned to us, and all of us will have to give an answer. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Everyone's going to stand before the throne and give an account. And those who have the responsibility of leadership and teaching in the church are going to have to give an account for how they did that. 1 Corinthians 3, Paul talks about our works being tested by fire. He says there's the foundation that is Jesus and we build on that foundation. And he says in the end, all that we build is going to be tested by fire. And listen to what he says, 1 Corinthians 3, 14 and 15. He says if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So everything that we do is going to be tested. It's going to be evaluated and we will be rewarded accordingly. And so our work as teachers, as leaders, will be evaluated and judged. So, so Paul is not saying to Timothy, you're going to be judged and he's going to decide whether you get eternal life or not. That's been dealt with. But your work is going to be evaluated. This is why it is so important, and it's easy for me to say, and it's easy for other leaders to say, you know, you need to, to submit to leadership in the church. You need to obey leaders in the church. That's easy for me to say. But the reason why we see in Hebrews 13, 17 is, is for this same reason. It says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. So understand, leaders in the church, as much as we may fail and as many issues as we may have, are going to have to stand before God one day and say, this is why I did this. This is why I didn't do this. And so when, when in the church we have people that are clamoring for something that is according to their preferences, remember the leaders may not give you what you want, but they will have to stand before God and answer for that. So understand, they're not doing it because they don't like you. It's because we have to say, well, God, what do you want us to do for the entire congregation? And then answer to him face to face one day. So Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God, in the presence of Jesus, who is the judge, to, verse 2, preach the word. That is his command, preach the word. He's already told them false teachers are a reality, and they're going to become more prevalent as time goes on. He's already told them, about the effectiveness and usefulness of the word, now he commands him, preach the word. Basically, it's powerful, it's effective, use it. Use it. He tells him, verse 2, to be ready. And the picture here is of a soldier ready for battle. At a moment's notice, the soldier has to be ready for battle in the same way 
God's man needs to be prepared to preach the word, teach the word at a moment's notice. And then he goes in verse 2 and says, when, he says, in season and out of season. Really, the simplest way to understand that is all the time. There is no wrong time. There is no off season when it comes to teaching the word. It is necessary under any and all circumstances. You can't just teach the word when it's popular. You can't just teach the word in formal settings like this. You can't just teach the word in favorable conditions. Culture, popularity, acceptance, location, all this stuff has no bearing on whether or not we should teach the word. We should teach it all the time. And while this command is for a teacher of God's word in an official capacity, somebody who has a position in the local church as a teacher of some sort. Remember, these these letters are the pastoral epistles written to Timothy and, and used by leaders throughout the centuries. This extends to all of us because we royal priesthood. And Dusty shared about that on Sunday morning, talking about the priesthood in, in Exodus. That was two Sundays ago. I'll get there. Two Sundays ago, sharing about the priesthood and their, their garments that they wear and their consecration, the fact that they've been set apart for God's purposes. And, and we, he talked about the fact that we are in the same position. We've been set apart. We've been clothed in Christ's righteousness so that we can do God's work. And so when we, in this position as priest, we should constantly be presenting God's word to others, both inside and outside of the church. We're really quick sometimes to share our opinions on things. We should be much quicker to share God's word. Now, maybe that's to share God's word to back up what our opinion is, to say this is why I have this opinion, because I found it here in the word. We should be quick to share God's word. We should also, by the way, be quick to change our opinions if God's word says something else. And sometimes we hold on to to our opinions and on certain things when we need to be looking in God's word and maybe those opinions need to be changed. But we must preach the word in season and out of season. And that is a charge for all of us to constantly be presenting the word. If I have an opinion on something, it should be rooted in God's word. And he goes on to tell him in verse 2, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. And so this is in keeping with and lining up with what he said at the end of chapter 3, what Scripture is useful for. In this instance, we see both reproof and rebuke, which are a lot of times they kind of cross over. They're translated uh, differently in different ways. And sometimes you'll see in one Bible it'll say reprove and another one it'll say rebuke. But here we have both side by side. And so there's these four things that he tells them here. First of all, reprove means, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, basically to prove something is wrong by providing biblical evidence. Evidence is part of the meaning of that word. We provide biblical evidence. This is also translated in some Bibles as convince. To convince somebody they're wrong, not by my opinion, but by what the Word of God says. It is to prove someone's fault. John MacArthur says, It is correcting behavior or false doctrine by using careful biblical argument to help a person understand the error of his actions. You're wrong because it says so right here. Not because I said so, but because it says so in God's word. And so we reprove or or we correct or convince someone of their error, not by arguing our opinions, but carefully explaining the word of God to them. The second one is to rebuke, which is to show a strong disapproval. You're wrong. I just showed you. Now I need to make sure you understand this isn't right. And not that I don't dis, not that I disapprove, but God does according to his word. This comes again through the word of God. We show disapproval for their actions and call them to correct their actions. Number 3, we exhort. This is the those first two are kind of the negative side. These the last two are the positive side. Exhort means to encourage or literally to beg, to beg someone. We are encouraging them. It's not encouragement in the sense of, hey, you're doing a good job, but encouraging them after we've proven them to be wrong, encouraging them to turn around 
This is a call to repentance. God's word says you're wrong. Now you need to repent and, and change the way you're thinking and acting. And that, again, that word can literally mean to beg. To beg someone to see the light and to turn around. And he says, number four, to do all of this with complete patience and teaching. And so Paul's saying what, what you should do in teaching the word, which, by the way, you should do all the time, in season and out of season, is we do these, these things, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with complete patience and teaching. And when we see these words, reprove or rebuke, we think, I mean, drop the hammer, man. Make it hurt. But here he says, with complete patience. By the way, that can be necessary at times. But Paul is calling Timothy here to do it with complete patience. And that means perseverance, patience, long-suffering, endurance, steadfastness. The, the word depicts a couple things. One, that you're not expecting immediate results. If you're doing something with patience, you're not expecting it to immediately have results. Not that it couldn't, but you're not expecting it. And two, that you're not going to give up on that person right away. We have patience. We are going to walk with them. Continue teaching. He says, with complete patience and teaching, continue to teach. Continue to open the word and let it do what it does. So we teach the word all the time. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. And all of this takes place in the context of teaching God's word. Whether that is in a one-on-one -on -one conversation where we open up the word or whether that's in a setting like this or Sunday morning classroom, coffee shop, whatever it is, we do this. We, we teach God's word. In either way, whatever the setting is, the correction of bad doctrine is accomplished, not necessarily by berating people and smacking them with our Bibles, but by teaching carefully, patiently the word of God, opening it up and letting it speak. And, and the reality that we have to understand from this is that sometimes we want to, man, we want to, we want to drop the hammer hard on something. And sometimes, again, that's necessary. But we have to realize God's word is a hammer in and of itself. Sometimes we just have to open it up and read it, and it will drop itself on someone. And let that be what happens. We have a desire to see someone come to faith, or we have a desire for someone to, to return to the roots of their faith that maybe they've strayed away from, we present the word and we let the word do that. It is what divides between bone and marrow and soul and spirit. It is what can do that, not our words and opinions. So he says, do this, teach the word in season, out of season. And then he goes on verse three and four. He says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Man, if we haven't seen that in our world today. Paul says the time is coming. I think that time has come and it will continue to get worse. He says where people will not endure sound teaching. And that word endure means to tolerate. And the picture is of people who maybe for a time will say, you know what, I'll sit and listen to this. I may not agree, but I'm going to sit and listen to it. But a time is coming when those people are going to say, nope, I'm not even going to sit and listen to this. I'm out of here. I'm walking away. And, and instead what they do is they begin to accumulate teachers for themselves. And so he's, he's not here. This is what we need to understand. He's not talking about people turning to false religions necessarily. He's not saying somebody sitting in a Christian church and all of a sudden decides to go to the mosque. He's saying people sitting in the Christian church who claim to be Christians are going to start going after other things that are not the true gospel. Some of those in our day and age are, are the health and wealth gospel. And God, wants, God just wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. He wants to bless your socks off. And if you're faithful to him, he's going to give you everything you want. You won't get sick. You'll have plenty of money in the bank. And if you don't, that means you're not faithful enough. There's a lot of people teaching that out there. 
There's a lot of people out there teaching universalism. Man, loving God would never send people to hell. In the end, you know, love wins. Everybody's going to go to heaven because God is love. It's dangerous. Or there, there are many ways to get back to God. There are many ways. Who, who am I to judge the way you choose to get to God? No, well, there's one way. Scripture's pretty clear. His name is Jesus. There's, a, there's the permissive grace gospel, and I put that in quotes because Paul said there is no other gospel. But permissive grace, this idea that dates, by the way, back to, to the early church because Paul addressed it, this idea that, well, you know, grace has covered us, we just do whatever we want. Live however we want because God's grace has covered us. You don't need to change, just be who you are. They love to take the, the story of the woman caught in adultery, you know, where Jesus says, let, let he who has no sin cast the first stone. And they say, see, Jesus just loves everybody just the way they are. And they totally leave out the part where he says, go and sin no more. There are people teaching this out there. Paul said in, in Romans 6, 1 and 2, he said, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can, he, how can we who died to sin still live in it? But there's people teaching it. And man, it makes people feel good because you know what? I can do whatever I want and I don't have to feel bad about it. There, there's people out there teaching works and legalism. You will be saved by the things you do. Live a good life and you'll be saved. Do this and this and this and this and you'll be saved. When scripture says by grace you're saved. There's people out there teaching relative truth. And your truth is whatever it is for you and my truth is whatever it is for me and we can be friends because what's true for you is true for you and what's true for me is true for me. It doesn't matter if it's totally opposite. <clears throat> and Jesus said, sanctify them with the truth. Your word is truth. And that's it. And so there's, there's so much more. There's so much false teaching out there. And Paul says in verse 3, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. <clears throat> There are many out there, and you've, you've probably heard of, of some of them, you know, uh, and, and I just say this to, to prove a point. Some of the biggest churches that we have in our country are churches with people teaching these things. <clears throat> Lakewood Church, with Joel Osteen, 52,000 weekly attendees. And you know what he said? Somebody asked him one time, is there only one way to God? And he said, yes. Jesus is the only way. But there are many ways to Jesus. Another, another one is Creflo Dollar. You may have heard of him, a, a popular prosperity gospel preacher. Two Rolls Royces and a private jet and multi-million dollar house. His church has 30,000 members. T.D. Jakes, another one. His church has 30,000 members. A more, a more recent one, and, and there's some debate on this, but Elevation Church, Stephen Furtick, who has uh, been accused of prosperity gospel preaching and uh, something called, if you've never heard of, narcissus, basically putting yourself in the center of Scripture, making yourself the center of, of Scripture. Man, their church is exploding. 15,000 weekly attendees. People are flocking to churches to hear something that just sounds nice and good and makes you feel warm and fuzzy. There are multitudes of other preachers and teachers out there who teach something contrary to the truth of God's word and people flock to them because it's appealing. And there are, are likely people in our own church who don't go to those churches, but maybe I just like to listen to this one or that one every once in a while because it makes me feel good. We have to be careful. We have to be careful. And notice Paul here says they will accumulate for themselves teachers, plural. Well, this one scratches this itch and this one, this one, and I'm going to get a bunch of them and make everything, he says, to suit their own passions. This is not to say that you can't have multiple, sit under multiple teachers. And I encourage you to, to read books by solid authors and listen to podcasts and sermons but the truth is we have one teacher. It's the word of God. And 
And you can have many people teaching the Word of God to you, but you have one teacher. If somebody is not teaching the Word of God, then we need to run away. <clears throat> Paul says people are going to accumulate all these, these teachers because they have itching ears. They want to hear something nice. <clears throat> but he says in verse 5, As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, Fulfill your ministry. As for you, again, setting them apart, you're different. As for you, do these, these four things. Be sober-minded, meaning be, be cool and calm and collected. It literally means to be temperate, endure suffering. Because people won't endure sound, sound teaching, you will be forced to endure suffering. And again, first, or sorry, 2 Timothy 3.12, we talked a couple weeks ago, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. That word means one who brings good news. It's, it's used in the New Testament a few times in reference to those who are called to take the message of the gospel to the lost, but weren't apostles. He says, do the work of an evangelist. And according to Ephesians 4.11, this is one of the official offices in the church. Uh, uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers. And so here, Timothy is, is a, a shepherd or a pastor. And so he's not changing his role. That's why he says, do the work of an evangelist. Go do this work. Go take the gospel to people who need to hear it. It's not enough for the teacher, for the pastor, for the leader to equip the saints for works of service, they should also be doing the role of an evangelist and taking the gospel to those who have not heard it. <clears throat> and then the fourth thing he says, fulfill your ministry. As we, we just said, his primary ministry is a pastor teacher in the church. This was the ministry that God called him to. And, and Paul's simple command is fulfill this ministry. Do what you've been called to do. And this is an important call for all of us. God has given you a ministry. And it may not be standing on stage preaching. It may not be singing in front of everyone. It may be doing something behind the scenes that nobody ever knows about. Fulfill your ministry. Do what God has called you to do. Every ministry is important. All of us need to fulfill the ministry that God has called us to. <clears throat> Let's look at the last three verses, verses 6 through 8. Paul says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So he starts off, verse 6, he says, For I, and, and note we said before, when in verse 5 he says, as for you, is differentiating Timothy from the false teachers and those who follow him. But he's also setting them apart here when he says, for I. So there's a, a separation here. He's saying, what, what I'm teaching you is not just in light of the false teachers and those that are following them. It's in light of the fact that my ministry is coming to an end. This is a, a passing of the torch in a sense. He is giving Timothy commands to do certain things in light of the false teachers, but also in light of the fact that my time here is, is up. You have to carry the torch now. He says, my life is being poured out like a drink offering. If you remember back uh, the first lesson that Greg taught, Paul, he talked about the situation in the Roman prison. It's not pretty. Paul is writing this from a Roman prison. And he says, my, my life is already being poured out. If you look in, don't turn there right now, but if you look later in Numbers chapter 15, the drink offering was the last offering on the, of the daily offerings. They would do the burnt offering, and then at the very end they would pour the drink offering after the burnt offering was consumed. Paul is basically saying, my life is an offering to God. Everything I've done since my conversion is an offering to God, and I've reached the point where the drink offering is being poured out, the last offering. He's saying, my death is the drink offering, the last offering that I will make. 
And he says, it's already being poured out. I mean, you got a cup that's full, it's already starting to be emptied. He knows the end is near. He knows his time is coming. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly what happened at the end of Paul's life. There's different views historically, but most people believe that he was beheaded in Rome at the end of this imprisonment. That he didn't go home after this. That at the end, he was, he was beheaded. We know he died a martyr. We're not exactly sure if that's why. It doesn't say it in Scripture, so we can only speculate. But he knows whether God told him somehow, God gave him a sense and said, Paul, your time's up, or whether the executioner said, uh, Saturday, it's going to happen. We don't know. But he knows the time is coming. He says, verse 7, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He's reached the last days. And he says, I have finished the race. This statement, I believe, would, would cause Timothy to recall all that Paul endured in his life shipwrecks and beatings and stonings and imprisonments and all the stuff that Paul went through. And Paul's able to say here, I've kept the faith. If you've ever gone through something really difficult in your life, you probably know how much it can help to have somebody walk alongside you that's been there before, that struggled through that same thing and came out the other side to tell the story. That's what's happening here. Paul says, I've been, th I, I tell you to endure the suffering, I endured it. I'm enduring it right now, and my time's coming to an end. So Timothy has this hope, knowing he can do the same. He can, he can get through this suffering. My prayer is that each of us would be able to make this statement as we lay on our deathbed. I finished the race, I've kept the faith. If, if we can say nothing else, that's enough. And Paul goes on to say, verse 8, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He doesn't say, I earned a crown of righteousness. But he does recognize that there's one waiting for him. He trusts the promise of God. He doesn't trust in his own actions. He doesn't trust in his own accomplishments. He trusts in the promise of God. Remember what he said, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25. <clears throat> says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run? But only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Later he says that he disciplined his body so that he could run the race effectively. Now at the end of his life he can say with a clear conscience, I've run the race, I've kept the faith, and I know that this crown is waiting for me. I trust God that this crown is waiting for me. 1 Peter 5, 4 says, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. This is not just for Paul. This is for all of us who have faith in Jesus. And the beauty of it is, and this, this may be going off on a little bit of a tangent, but the beauty of this is, we will receive this crown. If we have faith in Jesus, we will receive this crown of righteousness. Revelation 4 it gives us a picture, and, and I can't say for sure if everybody's going to do this, but it says in Revelation chapter 4 that the 24 elders are around the throne, and they've got this crown on, and what do they do with it? They don't look in the mirror and say, man, look how good I look with my crown. No, they throw it at his feet. I, kind, I, I can't say because it's not in the scripture, but I kind of believe we're going to follow suit. We're going to get this crown of righteousness because of what Jesus did for us, and when we see him, we're going to say, what is this? How, you know, this is all I have to offer. I don't know, but it will be in an act of worship to give it back to him. So in, this, in this, these first eight verses of chapter 4, Paul's commanding Timothy, be faithful to the ministry God's called you to. In the midst of the false teachers, in the midst of Church members going and following those false teachers, be faithful to the ministry God's called you to. And the hope that Paul gives him is not a life filled with success and, and wealth and health. He doesn't say, do all this and God's going to give you everything you ever wanted. Instead, the hope that he gives him 
is a crown of righteousness in the life to come. The hope that you have in fulfilling your ministry and enduring suffering through all of this is in the end when we say, I finished the race, I've kept the faith, that we know there's a crown of righteousness waiting for us. We all have a ministry to fulfill. We all have a place that God has called us to serve. We all have a race to run. And now some may have just started the race and others may be nearing the finish line, but we are all on the course. We're all running the race that God has set before us. Let's run well. Let's keep the faith. Let's fulfill the ministry he had for us. And notice here, Paul didn't say, I finished the race because I'm, I'm retiring and I'm going to you know, take a few years to you know, travel through Europe before I, I pass on. No, the, the race was finished when his life ended. So we all need to realize the race isn't over until God takes us home. Now, he may, he may change the course a little bit. He may change the, the ministry area that you're able to serve in, but there's never a time that we see in Scripture where God says, go relax, don't do anything until you die. No, we run the race until he calls us home because we all have a ministry to fulfill. I want to read one last verse to you, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, since we, are all, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus had a race to run. It was a painful race. But it says in that verse, for the joy that was set before him, he endured it. We can do the same. We were, we're running the race, and there may be painful days, but for the joy set before us, and that joy is a crown of righteousness in the presence of God. For the joy set before us, we run with endurance, looking to Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. <clears throat> we thank you that you have given us a race to run. That in your infinite wisdom and power and majesty that you have called us co-laborers. You've called us to work alongside you in the mission to reach the lost. What a privilege we have. And Lord, I pray that like Timothy and like Paul, we would, we would endure the suffering, we would endure the hardship, we would run the race with endurance. And Lord, I pray in the end, whether that end is soon or whether it's many, many years away, I pray that we would be able to say that we finished the race, that we kept the faith, and our joy and our hope are set on that crown of righteousness. Not because it's beautiful, not because it's imperishable, not because it is valuable, but because it means that we will stand in your presence. And when we stand in your presence, Lord, that crown will be nothing more than something to cast at your feet to bring you glory and honor. So, Lord, we pray that you would help us to run our race that you've set before us to fulfill the ministry that you've called us to, whatever it may be, for your glory and so that others will know Jesus. And we pray it all in his name. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us?